starting in the Old Testament this morning. The big thumbs up. All right. She's walking away confidently, so I assume that means we got it. Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding, be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused, make their eyes dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. As we turn to Acts 28 this morning, we turn to the end of Acts, but not to the end of the early church. And not to the end of signs and wonders, not to the end of the works of the Holy Spirit. The early church goes on past Acts 28 and through the centuries and through the millennia, through people that continued to be right at the start all the way back where a whole bunch gathered in one accord. We see that still happening today. We see the church still meeting and the churches that submit themselves unto God and say, God, what would you have us do? Where would you have us go? Here am I, send me with open hearts and minds that just say, not my will, but your will be done. The church carries on. Make no mistake as we end Acts here, that mentality, that heart, that submission towards the things of God, that being in one accord, it was just as important back then as it is now today that we are in one accord, hungry for the will of God, hungry as we ask God, what's next? What would you have us do? How would you have us serve? That was the prayer in the upper room. That was the prayer over Paul before he went on his missionary journeys where a bunch of them just got together and they said, okay, we we feel like uh, we've we've planted churches in this local area. We feel like we've, uh, we've been discipling. We've been doing what Jesus says. What's next? And as soon as they got together and they just fasted and prayed, God gave them the answer. Show us, God, lead us, guide us in all things. Let your Holy Spirit be in control of this service, of every service, of this body, of this group of people. Lead us in this community. Help us just to be your hands and feet. Help us to get out of our own way. Help us to lay our lives down for the sake of the gospel and for your kingdom, God. Use us even when it's hard, even when we don't understand. Let it grow our faith. Let it make it so we know what it is to fully rely on God. Let him be our source and strength. When we last left Paul, he had been on a path that he knew would be hard. He'd been told time and time again by the Holy Spirit, that where he is going, he is going to preach the gospel, have the opportunity like never before, but that it will be the most difficult thing he's ever done. And he is now a prisoner here in Acts 28 on a ship bound for Rome, or at least it was bound for Rome until it shipwrecked. And by the grace of God, everyone on board was spared, and that's where we start today in Acts 28, Verse 1. Once safely on shore, we found that the island was called Malta. And the thing you need to know here about Malta is it's this island, this very small island tucked away in the middle of the Mediterranean. Paul has been sailing up and down the coast, primarily as he's going on these missionary journeys, planting churches. It's all up along the coast. It's not directly through the heart of the Mediterranean. 
Um, so, so far, he and no other Christians have made it to the middle. And they haven't, no one uh, has come to Malta yet to proclaim Christ. The way Luke writes it here, he and Paul didn't even know Malta existed. We found out that the island was called Malta. This was not their pre-planned destination. This is not where they had thought about going. When they set off, there was nothing on the charts that said, we're going to make a quick stop at Malta and then go on towards Rome. It wasn't part of the plan. Malta is a very small island, 17 miles long and nine miles wide. And suddenly, over 200 souls land on its shores, some of which are prisoners. Verse 2, the islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. So the natives of the island come out, and they are helpful. And you notice the word that Luke, who's writing Acts, what he uses to describe that kind of, of love? Unusual. It's unusual. I think this says something about the heart of the people on this island. They are serving. They are showing love. All these strangers just show up and their thing is, let's start a fire. Let's warm them. Let's welcome them. And Luke calls that unusual. That kind of love, that kind of just dropping everything and going to help these people that you don't know some that I'm sure looked a little rough around the edges. It was uncommon back then, but I'm, it's super common today though, right? Or is that a thing that we still struggle with? The church still struggles with at times. Luke calls it unusual because this vessel is Alexandrian. The centurion and his soldiers are Roman. These groups are not always popular. They would not always be the kind that you want to wash up on your shore. And then there are men that are prisoners. And for them just to say, come up, have a seat. You're welcome here. Here, have a fire, have a blanket, get comfortable, get warm. It just doesn't make sense, even to Luke. It would have been so easy for the natives to look at these stragglers coming onto their island and say, not my problem, and to pass by. But like good Samaritans, they came, and they led these men who have just experienced the trauma of 14 days of storm and then shipwreck. They led them to the fire with smiles and greetings and welcome. God wants these people in Malta to know him because they've got one of the commandments down. They are loving their neighbor the way he would have them do it. So at just the right time, God sends them Paul. And it wasn't part of Paul's plan. It wasn't part of the centurions or any of the people on that ship but it was always a part of God's plan. God sent Paul there while Paul wore chains through a storm and a shipwreck. Guys, do not let the circumstances, the hardships, the journey that you might have to be on sometimes to get to that person who needs to hear about the love of God, do not let it stop you. So often all we can see is the storm. All we can see is the shipwreck. And we can't see the person that's there in the distance that we're heading right for, that we're supposed to get to, that God is, is like, oh, I've got a mission for you. I've got a person for you. I am sending you out. You're going to have to endure, though, trials, 
suffering the storm. But so often when we're in the middle of it, that's, that's the time when we have to let our faith be the most active because that's when your flesh is going to be at its loudest. That's when your flesh is going to scream, give up, stop, blame God, blame your circumstances, blame people around you. Instead of just saying, God, I do not know what you have in store, but I believe whatever it is, it's good. It's for your glory. It's for the kingdom. I don't know how many times I prayed that prayer uh, when we moved up here to Iowa because there was at least a good five years where Tracy and I would have this thing of just, why, what, I don't understand, why are we here? What's going on, what's going to happen? And through five years of just my faith building, my faith growing and just me submitting my heart to God saying, God, I don't know, but you know. And so every single time during very stormy seasons, every single time I had the opportunity to speak the love of God over people, you better believe I took it. Because I believe God was ushering me into the lives of people that needed to hear the gospel. It's so easy to get distracted though, isn't it? In the storm, we have to trust that God holds us in the palm of his hand, that he is orchestrating events in our lives, shuffling things around just to send you to someone who needs discipleship, who needs the seed of the gospel planted in their lives. We need to tell people around us that Jesus loves them, that he died for them, that he rose again, that he came to set them free from the bondage of sin and death. He did it for me. He can do it for you, and he'd love to do it. If you call yourself a follower of Christ, guys, that is your purpose, to declare the kingdom, to speak freedom to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to declare the day of the Lord's favor again and again and again, person to person. Remember, they might be waiting for you at the end of a clear day when everything went right all around you, and you're like, oh, I don't have a care in the world. And hey, do you want to know the gospel? And other times it might be you just went through it. The darkest times of your life where just nothing seemed to go right. And then all of a sudden at the end, someone's like, can you tell me about Jesus? And then you're like, that storm was worth it. Because it brought me to this person that doesn't know him. The amount of trust that that takes sometimes. The fact that uh, we can look at Paul. This is happening in chains on the way to Rome to be a prisoner and eventually to his execution. And we look at stuff where I look at stuff so often as a person, as an Israelite in the wilderness where I stub my toe uh, or, you know, metaphorically, if something little goes wrong, and I'm just like, God, you've left me here to die. And we're not called to have that kind of faith. We're called to have that kind of faith of God. I trust you. I, I just want to be in the center of your will. If I'm in this place, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to let my faith uh, go farther. I'm going to, I'm going to dig deeper into your word. I'm going to trust and believe and pray and surround myself with other believers to help trust and believe and pray. And God, I believe that you will see me through until I see you face to face someday. Verse three, Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and as he put it on the fire, a viper driven out by the heat fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess justice has not allowed him to live. Couple things here. Uh, first off, what is Paul doing? I read this and, <clears throat> being real, open and honest here. 
after church every Sunday. Um, I will go home and I will sit. Guys, can you agree with me? Who loves a good sit? Oh, it's great. Especially after you're like, I feel I've, I feel I've done some stuff. I feel like I came, I gave glory and honor to God. I feel like I delivered his word. I fellowship with the body and I'm just, I'm happy. That was so good, God. And now I'm just going to sit. Oh, that sitting feels good. Paul just preached to these 200 plus souls on this ship. He broke bread with them. He prayed. He gave instruction uh, of what God said is like, in order for you all to make it to shore, this is what you're going to have to do. Listen to me. Believe me. Trust what I say. This is the will of God. And if you believe it, we're all going to get safely to shore. And then he was in a shipwreck. And, and then he got onto shore. And he's been through the same thing that all those other people are doing. And all the other people are welcomed. And they're sitting by the fire. And what's Paul doing? Is he sitting? He's gathering brushwood. Oh, Paul. He sets the bar high, man. He sets the, ball, the bar high. He keeps going. And what does he get for, for keeping going, for, for blessing someone else? Because the whole purpose of gathering brushwood is this is still about loving his neighbor as himself. This is still about I'm putting this on the fire. It's going to heat us all. It's going to warm other people. He's still being a servant to other people. And what does he get for his continued hard work after all that he's been through? He gets bit by a viper. <laughs> Yay! You ever have those feelings where you're, you're doing good, you're doing, I'm doing what I'm supposed to, and then all of a sudden, ah! There's this thing on my, what's happening? What's happening in my life? Why do I feel under attack all of a sudden? Now, I'm not saying the devil directly put that viper in that brushwood, but I do know that when sin entered the garden due to our, uh, our choice of, of rejecting to be obedient to God, that the devil got dominion over the world and twisted God's perfect creation, corrupting things and giving way to sin, death, mosquitoes, and coconut, and snakes that can kill a man. Might have overstepped on the coconut, I just think it's yuck. Um, anyway, this viper that should be able to stop Paul, right there, through the curse of sin and death, through its venom, it bites Paul. For sure, we know that the devil would not like the gospel to reach Malta. He would not like it to be preached on this island. So if he sent the snake, he's got to be like, yes! And if he didn't, he's still got to be like, yes! I believe... We get bit by metaphorical vipers all the time. All the time. By something or someone that the devil sent into our path to distract us, to cause us to stumble, that keeps us from doing what we were meant to do. And we let it sometimes when we choose to let it. A person lashes out at you, and we go down with anxiety and depression. Uh, in my many, many years of retail, um, I'm just that kind of person when if someone says one of those mean-spirited things to me, even though it wasn't my fault, I will let it hit me, and then it will be that thing in my stomach. Everybody know what I'm talking about? And maybe you have cast iron stomachs, and people say things, mean things to you, and you're just like, no. No, no, that's dumb. I'm not going to carry that around with me. I do. I carry it around right here. And I'll just be like, okay, have a good day. I'm just going to go feel like I want to throw up for several minutes. Um, and we just, we have those things uh, that, that people will come along or the things of this world will come along. A uh, person will lash out at you, and we go down with anxiety and depression. Uh, your addiction rears up and strikes, and you are in its grip, and you don't know how to stop. You were just living your life all of a sudden, and next thing you know, you're under attack. And that's the problem. 
If you are in Christ, you are not your own. That attack comes, and you can, with all confidence, of who you are in Christ Jesus, of who you are as a new creation, as a child of God, as a royal priesthood, you can shake it off and trust whatever happens next. If God wants you right where you're at, nothing will stop him from moving in and through you. Now, that does not give you license to go out and be like, I'm going to find some snakes. Don't do that. Don't do that. But do know that when the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, that you trust where God has you. If you're in the center of his will, if, he is, if, if you're trusting that he has led you to where he has you right now, and you have submitted your heart and, and life to God, then you need not worry or be afraid. Verse 5, But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. You might be saying, Josh, if I get bit by a metaf metaphorical viper, uh, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't always know how to shake it off. Because it's so easier said than done to live out that Taylor Swift song, right? which I will not say right now due to copyright infringement. They stopped me one time online when they were like, they were like, no, you can't do that. Um, but let's get really practical here for a second. The reason we so often struggle with anything that weighs us down is that we try to do it alone. Would you agree with that? Like something goes wrong in my life my first instinct is to handle it myself, is to try to, it's like, well, what do I need to do to change? How do I need to grow? My instinct is not to go to my wife and say, will you pray with me about this thing? Or to, to go to Ryan or other people and say, will you, will you stand with me and pray with me and believe with me through this thing? It's to, I, I want to try to handle it alone. I want to try to push through it alone. And then what happens is I get frustrated uh, when I fail, when, when I can't conquer anxiety and depression, addiction and sin and all that matter, when I can't do it alone, then I'm just stuck in a pattern of never being good enough, never being able to conquer sin, and I wasn't meant to. I wasn't meant to. God created us for relationship with him and with each other. So stop trying to do it all by yourself. Go to people in accordance with James 5, 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And then... When you do that, when you air the stuff that you are trying to keep to yourself, to work through by yourself, then get in one accord with those other men and women of God. Do not forsake the body. Meet, pray, learn, grow, serve. And as your roots go deep in the kingdom, when the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and when it tries to latch onto you with its iron grip, Know that he is within you, and he that renews your strength, he that rescued you from the pit, he will help you shake it off into the fire so that you can get to the next person who says, I have no hope, and can you tell me about Jesus? And you can tell them, well, I serve a God who is all about hope and who brought me through the storm so that I could do just that. So after Paul doesn't die, he's got the locals' attention suddenly. They think he's a god, lowercase g. 
But as Paul has done so many times in the past, he's going to correct them and introduce them to the one true God. Verse 7. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer placed his hands on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. <clears throat> After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. So I love how God works all the time. Paul gets an invitation to the chief of Malta, and God has him heal the chief's father. God makes his glory known through a snake bite and through healing. And then all the sick people of Malta come and God has Paul tend to their physical needs as well as their spiritual needs. And we know the lasting impact God had in that place. Because to this day, the place where they shipwrecked still in 2023 it's called St. Paul's Bay. Yeah. God sent Paul to these people to declare the gospel. God had Paul deliver it to them, to a bunch of good Samaritans who knew how to love people. They just didn't know how to love God. They didn't even know who God was. And they might have gone unnoticed for a long, long time. But God said, I'm going to interrupt the plans of man, send a storm, and shove them right into this bay. Don't be frightened. Don't be scared. And don't be dismayed when you find your plans suddenly interrupted and you get shoved into someone else's life. And, and then suddenly, you know, you're like, and I'm getting, I'm getting metaphorically snake bit and everything else happens. And then there's that person in front of you that is like, I'm lost and without hope. And you can look back at all the stuff you went through and you can be like, oh, that's why I'm here. And you can let them know who this God you serve is. There's another fun fact that I've, I've preached before and that's the fact that in Paul's day, there was a species of snake, which the text calls viper, that the locals knew was venomous and fully expected Paul to die after being bit. That why they were like, that's a death sentence right there. But now, in 2023, there are no snakes that are venomous to humans on that island. There are some poisonous snakes, but nothing that will kill a human. Uh, I've read a lot about this, and there are several articles that try to explain this away. But to this day, many of the inhabitants of Malta say, that's because of Paul. That's because one venomous snake bite that happened to a man of God, um, there wasn't a venomous snake on the island that could kill a person after that. So I just think that's cool. Um, all these... Uh, healings and lack of venomous snakes, it's not a wonder that after three months these natives load up the ship that is finally taking Paul the rest of the way to Rome. They bless Paul as he goes. Verse 12. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day the south wind came up and on the following day we reached Petioli. There we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. So we've seen this before from Paul. They stop at a port, and they got a little bit of time. They go look for the followers of Christ, and that is a common theme we've seen. They look, and when they find some, it's a party. I believe everybody that found this church, you probably had to look for it a little bit. We had to look. We, when we first came up to Iowa, we uh, went to another church for a time and we felt it was time to go to another church. We had to look for this one. Um, 
Paul has looked for Christians before. He wants to disciple, but he also needs encouragement and prayer. So he goes to look for other brothers and sisters to that end. My son is still looking locally right now at Marshalltown. Um, the last Sunday he was in Marshalltown at college, and the first time that me or my wife or his girlfriend could not be there. And my wife and I had a discussion, like, you think he'll go to church? I wonder if he'll go to church. And uh, my wife called him, and he's just like, yeah, I'm going to church. And that's just one of those things that I'm so happy about. Because our flesh, especially on Sunday morning, there's something about Sunday morning, your flesh is going to want to stay in bed. Your flesh is, is going to want to look for any excuse to not come and be with the body of Christ. Because your flesh doesn't want the things of God, but your spirit does. I know this feeling. For many years, my body wanted to sleep in more on Sunday mornings than any other day of the week. It takes effort to get your flesh up and go look for the brothers and sisters in Christ. It takes sacrifice. It takes a commitment to your spirit to say, I understand that I need this. My soul needs this. It needs to be reminded of the goodness of God, that he's at work in the body. It needs to sing God's praises, to honor God with my tithes and offerings, to hear the word of God opened and to see the character of God in its pages. Verse 14 there ends with, we came to Rome. A while back, Paul sent a letter to Rome, which we know as Romans. The believers there know Paul is coming, and they are pumped. Verse 15. The brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. This moment is cooler than we know. Because when the emperor himself would visit a place, it was custom for the inhabitants to walk to the outskirts of their town to receive him. So Paul is being treated with honor here by his fellow Christians, some who have walked 43 miles to meet him outside of Rome. What a sight for the centurion guarding Paul. These people have never met Paul, most of them, but they've read his letter and they are united in Christ. And so as they just show up coming all this way to help lead him into the city, Paul thanks God for these people who came out, who responded to the call, and it encourages Paul, who has seen some stuff, been through some stuff, I can tell you guys that is, is so necessary in the body of Christ because you can pour out, you can pour out, and you can pour out. And there have got to be times that you let yourself be poured in. I have had many seasons where I felt like I just got to give, 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 give. And then one person would be like, can I just pray for you? Um, can I get you, you know, can I help you in any way? And you know what my, my gut instinct, what my immediate response is? Now I'm good. Now I'm good. Inside, I'm like, please pray for me. Please just walk with me a little bit. Please just strengthen and encourage me with the love of God. Speak scripture over me. Um... We all need this. And you know this because if you're a parent, um, you've had this thing uh, over and over again where I love, I love my children, but what do our children do? They need a lot of stuff. They need a lot of love. They need a lot of encouragement. Um, they need times where you separate them or, or where you discipline them or you correct them or, whatever, or you instruct them, whatever. And you give 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 and you give. And then you have those moments where you put them into bed and you're like, 
and you just you exhale and you just breathe and you're just like, okay. Um, we, we need those times with each other. Uh, after all the stuff that we pour out and we give out, we need those times like it's happening here in Paul where we just come out and we show up. And I believe church is a big part of that. I believe prayer is a big part of that. I believe just times where people have uh, come to my work or uh, come to my home or I've gone to their home, that it just happens and it happens naturally. And we just do life together and we love each other and we strengthen and encourage each other. And all of that stuff happens by going out of our way to make it happen. It doesn't just naturally fall out of the sky. Um, so often there's, there's planning with, hey, let's get together. Hey, can I come to your house? Hey, I'm just going to show up at your work. Um, all those things happen. And, and I have made that a lot sound like it's about me, but it's also about you. I want to do that for you as well. I want you to do that for each other. Because not one person is called to do that for everyone. Verse 16. When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Three days later, he called together the local Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. The Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charges against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. I love that line, the hope of Israel. That means he is talking about the Messiah. Uh, Paul gets everyone there. He explains his arrest, and then he pivots very quickly to, I'm talking about the Messiah. I'm talking about Jesus. Um, Paul does that so well all the time throughout Scripture, throughout his missionary journey. He'll show up and be like, oh, it's so good to be with you today. Oh, you know who's great? Jesus. And just instantly. Um, I, there was one man in my life uh, that I knew could do that all the time through absolutely any time of his life that I knew him. My grandpa, Paul Gerard, this man could bring up Jesus at the drop of a hat through any storm, through, through the good days, through the bad days. As he was raising me, uh, he was this man who had endless patience, who spoke love over me, who saw me in very rebellious uh, periods of my life and would say, you know, I, I love you and I'm, I'm here for you and, you know, I'm always going to be speaking Jesus over you. As I got married, we'd show up, I'd show up with my wife and he'd just be like, let me pray over you. Let me just love you. Let me tell you who God is, the goodness of God. I remember when he had stroke after stroke after stroke, 10 strokes, and he can't, the left side of his face Left side of his body completely paralyzed, and he's sitting down, and I'm coming to see him. Hi, Grandpa, how you doing? And his thing is, let me tell you about the goodness of God. Man. <laughs> he would instantly pivot to Jesus. He would instantly pivot to the blessings and the favor and the love of God, and you still know him, right? You're still holding on to him. Be encouraged. That man was an encouragement machine. That man very much reminded me of this other Paul that we're reading about. Constantly loving people, serving people, and uplifting the name of Jesus. And man, that should be all of us. So Paul opens the door to talk about Jesus right away. And the people walked through it with him in verse 21. They replied, We have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of our people who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. So that, in other words, we hear everyone is, is against the gospel, so tell us more, Paul. So many times I've got to witness to people, it starts out like that. Uh, I've heard, uh, I've just heard so many bad things about church. People uh, had bad experiences, and I'm all, oh, really? Yeah, uh, the church, 
has done bad things because the church is full of broken people like me. Isn't it great that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us? Isn't it great that God doesn't give up on us despite us? Mind you, I wish more witnessing that I do didn't start off with, wow, every time I meet a Christian, they're just so great. I wish it was always like that. I wish it was like, oh boy, people just, uh, when I meet Christians, they just, makes me want to know Jesus. Um, but so often, uh, we, in our humanness, we can get it wrong. And so when we go out of our way and we show the love of God in times that don't make sense, you know what the world calls that? Unusual. Unusual. I heard that all the time when I was working retail, when I could just Keep us a genuine smile on my face and love people. And people would gossip behind my back or just confront me directly. How are you so happy all the time? And it sickened them sometimes. They were just like, I don't get it. And I'm like, Jesus, what would you like to know about Jesus? Let's talk about Jesus. So Paul gets a standing invite to preach by the local leaders. Uh, It's the opposite of Jerusalem where they were... You know, in Jerusalem, they were forming an unruly mob against them. They didn't want to hear about it. But here in Rome, they're all like, yeah, 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 absolutely come. Do you need a microphone? How can we help you out? Verse 23, they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So as we close, turn back with me to Isaiah 6 one more time. Because there's more to that chapter than what we read. Paul and you are given a hard task to go to the people who are ever hearing but never understanding, who can see but are spiritually blind, who had hard hearts, who don't want to be told that they need God because they want to be a God unto themselves, and they want to do what they want to do. It's getting more like this time in Isaiah 6 in our in our world all the time. And Isaiah asks in 611 something that I think every pastor, missionary, evangelist, follower of Christ at one point has asked God when they heard the call of God in their life to go forth and declare the kingdom of God. Verse 11. Then I said, for how long, Lord? How long do I do this? How long do I have to keep preaching? How long do I have to keep loving people, loving my neighbor as myself? How long do I have to keep making disciples? When do I get the tap out and say, I can be done? You would have thought Paul would, you know, take some downtime after a shipwreck. You would think that when he got to Rome and he got put under house arrest that he'd stop there. And what does it say? It says he just kept going. He preached with all boldness. 
He had guards on rotation. Oh, I bet he preached to every single one of those. In fact, we know he leads one of them to Jesus, at least one of them to Jesus. What's God's answer? In verse 11, Isaiah 6, verse 11, and he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken, and though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. For how long? Until there's no one around to listen. That's when we stop. You got people around you today? You gonna have people around you tomorrow? I bet you do. And I bet some of them got hard hearts. But God would have you go anyway and give them the invite to the kingdom. I bet some of them got soft hearts and they just don't know who God is because no one has ever told them. And God is sending you, maybe on a clear day, maybe in the biggest storm of your life, to land on their shores and to give them the invite to the kingdom. To either situation, I tell you this, it's not about you. It's just a joy to be in the room when someone meets their Savior for the first time. When someone encounters God. When someone understands that their sins are forgiven. It makes every storm worth it. It makes everything that you have been through worth it. That you just got to be there. And to know that as you look around, to know that you are not alone. You have brothers and sisters who would walk out to greet you. So go and tell someone the good news today and tomorrow and every day that you have someone around you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.